This chapter is about um, chemistry, and um, chemistry sometimes is one of those things that students really don't enjoy learning about because when you're talking about um, the chemical makeup of things, um, most of us are visual learners, and a lot of these things are below the um, field of view. So I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can. Um, if you do have time in the future, it would probably help if you did take a chemistry class. Don't be afraid of it. Um, give it some time. And uh, once you start to um, open up into that world, it will give you a lot more information to help you in your in your journey through your healthcare professions because there's a lot of chemistry in blood work, urine analysis, just about everything that goes on in the body, acid-base balance, and having an understanding of chemistry is really important. So we'll keep it simple. Um, all matter is composed of elements. And elements are substances that are made up of atoms. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about atomic structure. And again, these things are below the field of vision. You don't see them. It takes a lot of atoms to make up an appreciable amount of something that you can see, millions and millions of them, as a matter of fact, so they're very, very tiny. And elements have physical properties and chemical properties. Physical properties are like if they're shiny or dull or a solid or a liquid, um, do they have an odor? Those are physical properties. And then chemical properties are like, are they combustible? Are they flammable? Do they react with other things? Um, so elements do have those types of properties. Now, if we're talking about the human body, there are four elements that make up about 96% of the body's mass. And these elements are carbon, which has an atomic symbol of C, hydrogen that has a symbol of H, oxygen that has a symbol of O, and nitrogen that has a symbol of N. So these four make up most of the substances that you find in the human body. Primarily what you would find in proteins, carbohydrates, fats, okay, um, and make up the backbone of nucleic acids. Now there are some other elements in the human body that make up a lot smaller percentage, a little less than 4%. So calcium, and the atomic symbol is uh, big C little a, and this you find in bone. Phosphorus, capital P, and that you also find in bone. Uh, potassium has the atomic symbol K, and potassium is one of those electrolytes that's really important for electrical transmission in the body, and we'll see this as we go on. Uh, sulfur, S, and that one you find uh, making bridges that help to hold proteins in their three-dimensional shapes. Um, sodium, capital N, uh, little a, and some of these really strange looking symbols uh, don't match the words at all because they're Latin, like this one here, Na is natrium, and natrium is the um, Latin word for sodium. Uh, chlorine, Cl, um, and sodium is the major uh, electrolyte that you find in the external cellular environment. Um, very important with potassium to uh, conduct electrical impulses that you find in nerves and muscles. Uh, chlorine is another um, type of substance, or it's an element that you found outside cells. Uh, it also, with sodium, makes up salt, and um, chlorine is another important electrolyte. Um, magnesium, um, Mg, that is also found in bone. It's also a cofactor in some proteins to make them functional. Um, iodine is uh, the element, and you see that's I for the symbol, and it goes into making up the thyroid hormone thyroxine. And iron, uh, Fe for ferrium, uh, Latin again, um, you find this binding oxygen in hemoglobin and myoglobin, which is an oxygen binding protein that's in muscle. So just a little um, preview on a lot of different elements and what their functions are. So you can see their importance and uh, their makeup in the human body. 
there's what we call the periodic table. Now, if you took chemistry, this would be something you would be very familiar with as you went along. And you can see the location of some of the elements we talked about. There's hydrogen right there, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Remember, um, these four make up 96% of, of all the elements and, and substances that you find in the human body. Um, some of the other ones, there's chlorine right there, number 17. There's sodium, number 11. We had iodine, that's down here. Um, so you can find all those different elements that make up the human body on this table. And each element is represented with this little box. And a little box, like the little box for sodium here you see in pink, it has different information about that particular element. So um, we will talk about these elements a little bit more as we go, th go through this chapter. Okay, so an element, how it appears on the periodic table. So you see there's a number at the top, number at the bottom. Here's your name of the element and your symbol. So the symbol is either a one or two letter abbreviation derived from the element's English or Latin name, the name, the element's common name, up on top is the atomic number. Now I'll just tell you for now, we'll explain it a little bit later, but the atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus as well as the number of electrons in the electron cloud. The bottom number is the mass number or atomic mass. That's the weighted average of the masses of all the elements isotopes. Rounding the atomic mass to the nearest whole number yields the mass number of the most common isotope. So. We'll talk more about what these are, but I just want to show you what information, basic information you can get from the block that represents each element on the periodic table. Now, the atoms that make up the element, atoms have a pretty common structure. They're composed of subatomic particles. There's the protons, they have a positive charge. There's neutrons, they have no charge and electrons that have a negative charge. Now, the protons and the, and the neutrons are found in the middle of the atom in a place called the nucleus. And the electrons orbit the nucleus in an electron cloud. And I have put up a little video under Chapter 2 Resources to give you some background information and some more information to look at and just another resource if you're having trouble understanding as we're going through here. Okay, so refer to that if you want some more information. And you can also, um, you can also look up in YouTube videos. There's all kinds of really nice videos out there that give you a different view or a different look at atomic structure and how elements are, are put together, some atomic particles and all that. You can go into it in more depth if you want to. So this is a look at an atom. This is the helium atom showing you um, in the nucleus the protons and neutrons. And helium um, on the periodic table is element number two. And so the atomic number tells you how many protons it has. So element number two has two protons, and the protons are red. The neutrons, they don't have any charge but they're also found in the nucleus and they're yellow. And so you have two of those and the electrons are on the outside and there are two electrons. This model here shows you what the actual um, arrangement of the electron is because they're traveling so fast. These electrons outside the nucleus are orbiting at a virtually the speed of light. So they appear as a cloud. You really can't see them where their position is and how fast they're going because they're traveling so fast. So it makes them look like a, a cloud. So this is called the planetary model because it looks like what you would see of the solar system with the sun in the middle and the planets and their orbits on the outside. So they call that the planetary model. And the orbital model shows you the electron cloud. Now, Atomic structure of the three smallest elements, if you go to three smallest atoms, if you go back to that periodic table, you'll see the hydrogen is located at the top left-hand corner of the periodic table, and it is the smallest element. It has an atomic number of one, and it has a 
mass of one, okay? Now, the things that have the weight in the atom are these two. Protons and neutrons roughly weigh about one apiece. Electrons are about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton or a neutron, so we don't really count them into the atomic mass at all. Now, most things don't have charges, meaning that you don't walk around shocking everything because you're not passing off any electrical current. Most things are neutral. So your positive proton and your negative electrons really need to be equal to make the atom neutral. So you will find if you have one proton, you have one electron that makes that atom neutral. And because hydrogen has a mass of one, there are no neutrons, okay? So one proton weighs one, the hydrogen atom's mass, the number at the bottom is one, so it has a mass of one very small element, just one proton, one electron. The next one, element number two, is helium. Now helium has an atomic number of two, so that means it has two protons. Remember, the atomic number tells you how many protons there are, so two protons. And because its mass is four, that means it has to have two neutrons. Because see, if your protons and neutrons each weigh one, your atomic number is two, your mass number is four, that means you must have four, two neutrons. So two protons plus two neutrons gives you a mass of four. And remember, your electrons don't have really any mass. It's negligible. So you have to have two electrons to balance out the two protons that have the positive charge. So that brings your charge to zero. So two electrons, two neutrons, two protons. Now, if you go to lithium and look at the number, look at this block on the periodic table, lithium has an atomic number of three and it has a mass of seven. So if it has an atomic number of three, that means it has three protons. If it has a mass of seven, that means it must have four neutrons. And to balance out the positive charge of the protons, it has three electrons. And you notice here that this closest orbital is full with two electrons, and then you have to come out into the next shell and start putting electrons in there. And that shell can actually hold eight. So two in the first and then eight in the second. Are you confused yet? All right, let's keep on going. So atomic weight, that's that bottom number that we talked about that makes us made up by the protons and the neutrons. But what that is, is the average of the mass numbers, relative weights of all isotopes of an atom. So an isotope, is a structural variation of the atom. Now remember we said that the atomic number tells you the number of protons? Number of protons doesn't change. If it's number three, that tells you it's lithium. If it's number one, if the atomic number is number one, it's hydrogen. If it's number two, it's helium. So the proton number doesn't change. But you can have heavier or lighter atoms based on the difference in the number of neutrons. That can change. So if you have more neutrons, it could be a different isotope, but they're still all the same element. So you could have, say, hydrogen that has um, no neutrons, and then you could have hydrogen that has one neutron, and that's a little bit heavier, and it's a different isotope than the one that has no neutron. So the definition of an isotope, they're atoms of the same element. They all have the same proton number but they have different numbers of neutrons. So again, the atomic numbers are the same, but the mass numbers are different. So here's an example. These are isotopes of hydrogen. So here's the one you see on the periodic table. It has an atomic number of one. So it has one proton. And because it has a mass number at the bottom of one, that means there are no neutrons and one electron balances out the positive charge in the nucleus. Here's something called deuterium. And deuterium is like a heavy hydrogen. It has one neutron. So it has a mass number of two. So again, by definition, the isotope is an atom of the same element that has a different number of neutrons. So this one has one neutron, that one has none. So this is a different isotope. Then you have something called tritium. Now tritium is radioactive. It's heavy, heavy hydrogen. So it has one proton, 
Now another neutron, and you notice the electron number hasn't changed at all. So there's no charge. It just means it's heavier or lighter depending upon the number of neutrons. So just want you to get this idea of the definition of an isotope. I don't want you to have to figure them out or anything. Just to make sure you know that the definition of an isotope are atoms of the same element. They're all hydrogen, but they have different numbers of, neut of neutrons. Okay? Now, combining matter, making chemical bonds. Chemical bonding involves the electrons that are in the outermost shell of the um, electron structure. Remember we said there was two in the first one, and then the second one can hold eight, and then it just keeps going out from there. So the octet rule says octet refers to eight, okay? So atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons, meaning that they form bonds with other atoms to achieve stability. And that stability rule means that they have to have eight in the outermost shell, all right? So they mix with each other to complete an arrangement that has eight in the outermost shell. Now, the, ex the exception to the rule is the first shell, because the first shell is full with two electrons. Um, all the other ones have eight in the outermost shell, okay? So there are, there are several types of bonds. Um, there's three major types. You have ionic bonds, then you have covalent bonds, and then you have hydrogen bonds. So let's look at ionic bonds first. This is looking at the sodium atom, and sodium on the periodic table is, is um, element number 11, so it has 11 protons. Its mass number is 23, so that means it has 12 neutrons, and it has 11 electrons. And see how it has two in the first shell, then eight go in the, in the second one. And because you have 11 electrons, that last one goes in this outermost shell. The chlorine atom is number 17. So it has 17 protons. Its mass number is around 35. And that means it has 18 neutrons. And then it has to have the same number of electrons as protons to, to balance out the charge. So you have two in the first shell, eight, that makes 10, and then the last seven go in the outermost shell. So here's what happens. Remember the octet rule says that atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons to have an outer shell that has eight electrons, right? This one has seven in the outermost shell. This one only has one. So if chlorine, this is what happens in the subatomic world, chlorine says, hey, you know what, sodium? Give me that one that you have there in the outermost shell. I'll take it from you, and that will give me eight in my outermost shell. Okay, I'll have eight. And then you can get rid of that one that's out there, and now you'll have eight in your outermost shell. So you're satisfying the octet rule, and I'm satisfying the octet rule. But what happens is, because this one has gained a negative charge, it has a surplus of a negative charge. There's still only 17 protons in the nucleus, but we have 18 electrons now, so it's got a charge. This one has lost one, but it still has 11 protons in the nucleus and only 10 electrons, so it has a positive charge because it has one more positive charge in the, nu in the nucleus than it does negative charges represented by the electrons. So, they call these ions. Ion, an ion is an atom with a charge. If it is a positively charged ion, they call that a cation. If it's a negatively charged ion, it's called an anion. And those opposite charges are attracted to each other. So they call this an ionic bond. And an ionic bond is usually a salt. It's a very strong bond, very difficult to break. Sodium chloride is table salt. So the transferring of one electron to another creates a difference in charges, and that's what draws these two um, ions to each other. An ionic bond is caused by a transfer of electrons, okay? So this is what table salt looks like and large numbers of sodium and chlor chloride ions assemble, they associate together to form salt crystals. 
Covalent bonds are formed by sharing of two or more valence shell electrons. Remember, um, the valence shell, that term means the outermost shell. Okay, that's, what's, that's where the bonds are formed is those electrons that are in that outermost shell. So it allows each atom to fill its outer shell at least part of the time. So carbon is atom number six. Has, so atom number six has six electrons. Two are in the middle and then four on the outside. Oxygen is element number eight. So it has two in the middle in the inner shell and it has six on the outside. So there's no way that you can transfer electrons to between the three so that you would come up with an ionic situation. You wind up sharing. So two from oxygen and two from carbon share. And over on this side, the other two from carbon and two from oxygen share. And so that gives you four plus four, eight in the outermost shell here, four plus four, eight in the outermost shell here. And then these four and these four are shared with carbon to give carbon eight. So this is called a covalent bond where you're sharing electrons, not transferring these. So there's a look at your um, carbon to oxygen um, covalent bonds. And this represents carbon dioxide. And there are two pairs of electrons being shared. So they draw a simple version of this with just two little lines instead of having to draw all those dots. And it shows that it is an equally shared relationship between the three atoms. They're, the molecule is linear, it's symmetrical, it's balanced, and they are nonpolar. So this table gives you a lot of information, putting together some of the things we talked about and drawing in um, another, uh, another item referring to polarity within molecules that are formed by bonds, okay, that maybe aren't exactly balanced. Let's talk about the very first one that we mentioned, sodium chloride, table salt, ionic bond, complete transfer of electrons, you have separate ions or charged particles to form. Okay, let's go over to the other side. Nonpolar covalent. We saw that with carbon dioxide. The atoms are equally share, the atoms equally share those electrons. The charge is balanced among the atoms. So this one's nonpolar. This one is completely polar. But then you have something where you have a polar covalent. So you have sharing, but it's unequal. And there's a slight negative charge at one end of the molecule and a slight positive charge at the other end. So it's not really a transfer. It's not equally shared, but there's a pull more towards the oxygen than towards the hydrogen. So if you think about that game tug of war, in this game with the tug of war, this particular atom or this team has won and it's taken the electron completely away from sodium. So this team has won the tug of war and dragged the other team across the line and transferred completely. Okay, so this is a complete transfer. This one here, nobody's winning. Both teams are equally matched. So it's a balanced arrangement. Both teams are equally strong. Nobody's winning. This one here, one team's a little bit stronger than the other. And it's pulling one team more in a direction, one direction than the other, but it's still not strong enough to completely take the team over the line. So it's somewhere in the middle. And you'll find that in a lot of situations, this middle ground is where a lot of, a lot of bonds are going to be found, okay, that unequal uh, polar arrangement. So just make sure you have a general idea of what these three different scenarios are by definition. And then your example would be sodium chloride for ionic, water for polar covalent, and nonpolar covalent, just carbon dioxide, because at this point in time, and with the amount of time we have, you're not going to have time to be able to figure all these out. Now, if you did take chemistry, you probably have to do that, but we're not going to do that here. Here's a look at uh, hydrogen bonding between polar water molecules. So when a molecule is polar, the blue balls here, those are hydrogens. This is uh, the red ball is oxygen. So this is a water molecule. 
the hydrogen end is uh, slightly positive and the oxygen is slightly negative. So you see these molecules have this static attraction to each other where the slightly positive end, the hydrogen end, is slightly attracted to the oxygen end. So they kind of line up and it has this static attraction. These molecules are kind of pulled towards each other. And this is what gives water its really unique properties. We call water the universal solvent because most things dissolve in water. It also has this cohesive property where it sticks to itself. If you put water in something that is nonpolar, like say pour it on wax paper or pour it into oil, which is a nonpolar substance, um, it will ball up and bead up and separate and it'll, it'll be very cohesive. Also, water has this wetting property. It's adhesive or it'll stick to other things. So a lot of things, water has the ability to to wet them or to dissolve in them. And most things, like we said, water is the universal solvent. Chemical reactivity. Water is the basis of synthesis and decomposition reactions, and we'll get into that later. And then the other property is thermal stability, that water gains and loses heat very slowly due to the hydrogen bonds that help to stick the molecules or bring them a little bit closer to each other. So let's look at mixtures a little bit. So there's a couple types of mixtures. There's a homogeneous mixture, which means it looks the same throughout, like homogeneous milk. Milk is homogeneous because it all looks the same. Um, there's two parts to a homogeneous mixture, which we call a solution. The part that's in lesser quantity is called the solute. The part that's in greater quantity is called the solvent. So if I had a glass of water with some salt in it, that would be my solution and my solute would be the salt, and my solvent would be the water. And remember, water is called the universal solvent because most substances dissolve in water. Okay, so homogeneous mixture solution. Now we have what's called heterogeneous mixtures. These are two or more components that are physically intermixed, but they keep their identities. So there's two types, colloids. They don't settle out. An example of, the, of a colloid is the cytosol, which is the liquid substance that you find inside cells. It's the li liquid matrix that all the organelles are suspended in. And we haven't really talked about it yet, but you may have had this in biology in high school or another class. Suspensions will settle out, like blood. If you draw a tube of blood, put an anticoagulant in there, then you would get the red blood cells that are heavier, they'll settle out the bottom, and then the plasma with the proteins will be on the top. So here's a picture that shows you heterogeneous mixtures. Um, particles are distributed non-uniformly usually, don't look the same throughout. Cereal and milk, ice and soda, soil, um, blood, okay? And homogeneous mixture, particles distributed uniformly, um, vodka, steel, air, rain, okay? Just to give you some examples. Now, acids and bases, I finally went to this picture this semester because before I was talking about um, the numbers of hydrogens and the number of hydroxide, and I don't want to get into too much of the chemistry. I just want to talk about the pH scale. And the pH scale runs from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. Water is neutral. doesn't have any acid-base characteristic to it. Anything less than seven is an acid. Anything greater than seven is considered a base. Anything less than two is a strong acid. Anything greater than 12 is a strong base. So you wanna have a general idea of the scale. Seven in the middle is neutral, less than seven acid, greater than seven base. Anything at the very end is like zero to two, strong acid. Anything 12 to 14, strong base. So that middle ground, say less than 7, greater than 2, weak acid. Anything greater than 7, less than 12, weak base. So less than 7, lots and lots of H ions or hydroniums. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail with that now. You can look it up. But greater than 7, not as much hydrogen. So pH refers to the concentration of hydrogen ions that you have in solution. 
when you have um, a pH less than seven, you got lots of them. pH greater than seven, not so many. So acid gives away protons, gives these things away, these H ions. Base takes them. Acids taste sour, bases taste bitter. Acids are sticky, bases are slippery. And so some examples of acids, lemon, soda, egg whites are base, melons. Okay, so this kind of simplifies it for you a little bit more. And if you want to study more on acids and bases, you can on your own. We will be talking about acid-base balance when we get to the other end of AMP2, which is a long way off. We'll cover that in more detail. So a buffer. What's a buffer then? A buffer is something that resists an abrupt change in the pH. And we have a lot of naturally occurring buffer systems in the body, in the urinary system, in the blood, to make sure that every time that you eat um, an orange, you're not going to go into acidosis. So you have buffers that will neutralize anything that you ingest and changes that occur um, metabolically to make sure that your pH doesn't change. So if you have a problem, say, with too much stomach acid being produced, this is something you commonly do and may not realize that you're taking a buffer. So when you are taking an antacid, which is a base, it's buffering that excess stomach acid and helping to prevent the burning that's associated with that extra acid that might get up into the esophagus and result in GERD or result in um, that uh, acidic burn that people get sometimes when they have problems with too much acid. So buffer systems are so important. I just want to mention it now, but we, we won't get to this until AMP2. But a buffer is something that resists a change in pH, okay? A very, very important in acid-base balance. Um, okay, so let's look at some simple chemical reactions. So a synthesis reaction, when you're synthesizing something, you're putting it together. Um, the generic expression would be you have A, and then you add B, and you put together something that's called AB like say sodium plus chloride ions will give you sodium chloride which is table salt and atoms or molecules combine to form larger more complex molecules always involves bond formation and the term that's also used with synthesis is anabolic anabolism here's a synthesis reaction smaller particles are bonded together to form larger more complex molecules and another example is proteins are made of amino acids. So amino acid molecules linked together form a protein molecule. So that's an example of a synthesis reaction. The opposite is decomposition. I have something that's together and I'm gonna break it apart. The molecule is broken down into smaller molecules or its constituent atoms. It's the reverse of a synthesis reaction it involves breaking the bond that holds them together. And the term is catabolic. So anabolism, anabolic, putting things together, catabolic, catabolism, breaking them apart. So here's an example where bonds are broken in larger molecules resulting in smaller, less complex molecules. Glycogen is a storage molecule for glucose that you store in the liver. And in the, at the right time, in between meals usually, is when you break down the glycogen and release glucose into the bloodstream to keep blood glucose levels balanced in between meals. So that's a very large molecule and you break it into the individual pieces. That's a catabolic reaction decomposition. So what affects how chemical reactions occur? Well, there's a few things. If you increase the temperature, if you heat up something, it'll increase the rate of the reaction. If you increase the concentration of the reactants that are going into making something, that's going to increase the rate. If the particle size is bigger, it takes more energy to get larger, larger particles going, and that's going to slow it down. So the bigger something is, the, the uh, more energy is required to make that reaction happen. Now, a catalyst and an enzyme are the same thing. And if you add a catalyst to a reaction, it increases the rate without being chemically changed or part of the product. 
you have a lot of enzymes, millions of them in the body, that are biological catalysts. And these things help to speed up the reaction without being consumed by the reaction. Now, let's talk about classes of compounds. Inorganic compounds we've already spent some time with. We talked a little bit about water. We talked about a little bit about salt and ionic bonds, acids and bases a little bit. But inorganic compounds mean they generally do not contain the element carbon. Okay, so inorganic compounds, its own little category, doesn't contain carbon. Organic compounds, however, they do contain carbon. And these are some of the most important molecules that you find in the body because these organic compounds, the backbone is carbon, and that's the backbone of your carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. So they do contain carbon. They're usually very large molecules, and they're covalently bonded together. So that means most of the time they're nonpolar, and they are and they share electrons. Now, inorganic and organic are both equally essential for life. But this is the group that we're going to focus on right now. So, we mentioned earlier one of the properties of water was the reactivity and that water was the basis for synthesis and um, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis reactions. So, I want to explain to you that if you're going to be building proteins or you're going to be building lipids or nucleic acids or carbohydrates, um, you do this by a reaction called dehydration synthesis. It's the same for any group of organic compound. It's the same reaction. If you want to break them apart, it's hydrolysis, all right? So the word dehydration means to remove water, right? So in order to put something together, you have to take away H2O. This means it's just a monomer. It, doesn't, it could be a protein, could be a carbohydrate, could be a fat. It's just a generic formula. So you have one thing here, one piece here, and another piece here. It doesn't matter, matter what it is, but you're going to take H from one, OH from the other. Those two things together make a water molecule. So by taking out water, it brings them together and forms this linkage that binds them together. And this is what forms the covalent bond. So the monomers are joined by removal of water from one monomer and the uh, OH from one monomer and the removal of H from the other site of bond formation. So dehydration, synthesis, putting things together by removing water. Hydrolysis, the word lysis, this end part means to split. Hydro refers to water. So you're splitting by adding water. So here now you have something that is together and you're going to put water in and you're going to take it apart. So this is like when we put some words together that we've already used, this is like a synthesis reaction, synthesis or anabolic, right? Putting things together. And this is like hydrolysis is very similar to decomposition or catabolic reaction. Okay, so the words kind of go together. So here's some examples. Okay, you have two um, simple sugars, glucose, which is blood sugar, fructose, which is fruit sugar. So if I want to put them together, I can pull a molecule of water out, okay, and make this disaccharide. These are monosaccharides, one sugar. This is a disaccharide that's called sucrose, and sucrose is commonly called table sugar. So it's one molecule of glucose glucose and one molecule of fructose makes sucrose. If I want to break it apart, then water is put in and I break them apart. So carbohydrates are also called sugars and starches. They're polymers, meaning that they're very big molecules. They contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You don't really need to worry about the formula, but there's three classes. Monosaccharides, one sugar. Disaccharides, two sugars. Polysaccharides are many sugars. And here are some examples of monosaccharides. There's glucose. We said glucose is blood sugar. Fructose is fruit sugar. And galactose goes into milk sugar. And these two sugars here, 
These are found in nucleic acids, okay? So we'll kind of leave these off to the side for now. Now I can put two sim two simple sugars together, two monosaccharides, and I can make disaccharides. So if I take glucose and fructose and put them together, we saw this earlier, we get sucrose, which is table sugar. If I take two glucoses and put them together, I get maltose, which is malt sugar. And then if I take a galactose and put it with a glucose, I get lactose, which actually is milk sugar. Polysaccharides, we're not going to talk about really too many. The one that's really important in the human body, though, is glycogen, because we said that glycogen was our storage molecule for glucose. So these are very long chains of linked monosaccharides, and um, glycogen is our storage molecule for glucose. Next category, lipids. Lipids contain, again, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen less than in carbohydrates and sometimes phosphorus. These are insoluble in water. We also call them fats. And there's four major groups. The major, uh, the most important and most commonly found fat is a neutral fat that's called a triglyceride. Phospholipids, very similar. I'll show you the structure. Steroids um, have a different structure from these two entirely and icosanoids are generally um, compounds that are used or found involved with inflammatory processes that go on. I'm not gonna to talk too much about these in this chapter, just to know that they are in the lipid category. We talk about them a lot in later chapters. This is a triglyceride. It has a three carbon glycerol molecule with three long fatty acid chains and you have to remove three molecules of water to put together the triglycerides. So three fatty acid chains, one, one glycerol molecule makes up a triglyceride. This is a phospholipid, and a phospholipid has glycerol, and it has two um, fatty acid chains, and then it has a group on the other end that's usually polar, okay? So a phospholipid tends to be polar, and if you want to abbreviate this real complex structure here, you just draw this little round circle to represent the phosphate head. And then you draw the fatty acid tails that are nonpolar. They don't have any charge. Um, so this has a charge, see? That's why they call it polar. And you just draw this little ball with two tails, and that's the abbreviated structure for a phospholipid. So simplified structure of a steroid, this is a steroid, and you see these four interlinking rings, and they don't show you the details here, but wherever these lines come together, there'd be a carbon there. And this right there, this line, double line right here is a double bond. And I'm not, you know, don't be, wor don't be worried about drawing any of these or anything like that. When I was in school and took biochemistry, we had to learn how to draw all these and had to identify the different structures, but you don't really have any need to learn that. It is interesting, and I would encourage you at some point to take a class, but for right now, we're just going to try to stay with the basics. So I want you to know that cholesterol is the basis for all steroid hormones that you find in the body. So some of these steroid hormones with males is testosterone, females is estrogen, progesterone, and cholesterol is the precursor to all of those hormones. Icosanoids, there are many different ones. They're arrived from the fatty acid, so they are fats. Arachidonic acid is the molecule that they come from. Um, they're the most, the most important icosanoids are involved with inflammation. So prostaglandins, you may have heard that word, but prostaglandins are inflammatory molecules. They also play a role in blood clotting, control of blood pressure. Again, I'm highlighting this word because inflammation is where you really see them. So I cover them more in the immune chapter and also involved in labor contractions. So it's its, its own little category. I won't ask you anything about it now, but um, just know that it is in the fat or lipid category. So there's something to be said about saturation of fatty acids. Now, if you have a saturated fatty acid, you have single bonds between all the carbon atoms that make up those um, fatty acid chains. 
maximum number of hydrogen atoms, and they're usually solids at room temperature, and they're animal fats. Butter is an example of a saturated fatty acid, solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fatty acids, um, you're missing some hydrogens. So you have double bonds between the carbon atoms. And these are plant sources of fats, and they tend to be oils at room temperature. Remember, animal fats, solids at room temperature. Uh, Anim, um, unsaturated fats tend to be plant sources of fat, tend to be oils, canola oil, olive oil, peanut oil, okay? These tend to be healthier for you. Um, also, another thing about saturated fatty acids, animal fats also are the major source of cholesterol. Plant sources of fat, not so much. So, um, plant oils tend to be a lot healthier for you. Um, trans fats, which are modified oils where they take corn oil, you've probably seen like margarine. Margarine is where they take corn oil, they hydrogenate the molecules, put the hydrogens back on and makes it sort of like a semi-solid, that's margarine. It's maybe a little bit better for you because it doesn't have the cholesterol, but it has what are called trans fatty acids. In the process, it forms this type of a fatty acid that the body can't really do a whole lot with. And it tends to be connected with the plaque that forms in the interior surface of large blood vessels that cause atherosclerosis later on. So you want to try to avoid these. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids that you find in fish and seafood products, these are heart healthy. These are really good uh, sources of fats that are healthy for you and tend to negate some of the damage that is caused by the unhealthier fats to that have the, maybe the modified fats or trans fatty acids. So the bottom line is with fats, you know, you don't need a whole stick of butter on a piece of toast. You know, you just need a little bit. So moderation, moderation and try to stay with natural products more than the modified uh, trans fats that you see out there. Other lipids in the body. Now, there are some vitamins that you take that are fat soluble, that you need fat to help absorb these through the GI tract. And one of them, or four of them, A, D, E, and K, I won't talk about them in detail now, but those are the four vitamins that are fat soluble. B and C vitamins are water soluble. So um, those you can take in larger quantities and you will just pee them out if you don't need them. They don't store up in the body. These can have toxic application if you take these in mass quantities because they can store up in tissues. Um, lipoproteins, they have a lipid part and a protein part. These help to transport fats in the blood. And so these are other sources of lipids in the body. All right, now we're going to go on to proteins. So proteins are composed of amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids. So all of these, this is a generic structure of an amino acid. They all have this little orange bubble here, but then the green part, the side group, is different. Okay, so this is glycine. That's the simplest amino acid with just an H here as a side group. And then aspartic acid, um, it has an acid. The COOH group is a, a carboxylic group that makes it an acid. Um, then you have lysine. It has a base group on it. It has an amine group. And then you have um, cysteine that has a sulfohydryl. Um, so we said sulfide bonds are what holds things together. And so having that sulfur there you can see that this molecule can participate in intramolecular bonding. So different amino acids. So how do we put proteins together and break them apart? Same type of reactions, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So two amino acids, take an OH off of this one and H off of this one, and that puts together two amino acids to make this bond called a peptide bond. And because it's two amino acids, you call it a dipeptide. Taking them apart, then you have to add the water back in. So there's levels of protein structure because proteins have three-dimensional shape. The simplest structure is just the uh, polypeptide chain, where the amino acids are linked together to form the chain.
The second structure is where you have hydrogen bonding that occurs from different areas of the chain further downstream. And hydrogen bonding, remember, generally we talked about hydrogen bonding between water molecules, the slightly positive oxygen, a slightly negative oxygen to the slightly positive hydrogen, and sometimes nitrogen can play a part too because it tends to be slightly negative charge. But this is showing you oxygen to hydrogen. So that chain can fold up into a coil. And this is called an alpha helix, all right? So that's a secondary structure. Sometimes you can have chains that are nearby each other, and they just kind of are statically attracted to each other to form a sheet. And this is called a beta pleated sheet, where the primary chain zigzags back and forth, forming a pleated sheet. Adjacent strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. Okay, and this is the spiral. So you have the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. There is another structure. The most common protein that you find in the body is called collagen. It holds everything together. And collagen is a triple braid. Okay, it's like a triple uh, helix. And that's a very strong, strong fiber. So it's one of the strongest proteins you have in the body, and that's collagen. I just want to throw that out there in case it doesn't show up on here. Tertiary structure is where you have more folding. So superimposed on secondary structure. So you have alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets are folded up to form a compact glob. It's like this is what they call the glob. So globular molecule held together by intermolecular bonds, more hydrogen bonding. And this tertiary structure <coughs> is very characteristic to functional proteins um, like thyroid hormones, um, thyroxine, okay? Um, also myoglobin that bonds to oxygen in muscle cells. So I mean, most of your most of your proteins you're going to find are active in this form. There's a quaternary structure, and that's where you have two or more polypeptide chains, um, each with its own tertiary structure combined to form a functional protein. So you can have uh, two or more tertiary structures come together to make this quaternary structure. And they, they mention here pre-albumin molecule, but I'm going to tell you one of the common quaternary structures that you will find is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin has four subunits, and it binds oxygen in the blood. It's, it's found in red blood cells. So those are your four levels of protein structure. Primary, the chain. Secondary, alpha helix beta pleated sheet. And remember, collagen has the triple braid. Tertiary is your globular structure, can be functional at that point. And then your most complex is your quaternary structure. So because proteins maintain this three-dimensional shape by very weak hydrogen bonds, then temperature change and drop in pH can really affect that three-dimensional structure and can actually make it fall apart. So the term denaturation refers to globular proteins that lose their three-dimensional shape, and their three-dimensional shape gives them the ability to bind to other things and make them work as enzymes or perform an action. And those sites that are, are there because of the three-dimensional shape, if they fall apart, those sites are destroyed. So the things that can cause denaturation conditions, a decreased pH, okay, too much acid, or if you crank the temperature up too high. Usually in normal body conditions, because the body tends to try to maintain homeostasis under all conditions, but usually reversible if the normal conditions are restored quickly. Irreversible if changes are extreme. Say like somebody that suffers from sunstroke. If you don't get that temperature down immediately, proteins start to fall apart, organs start to fail, and then it's too late. But an example of protein denaturation is cooking an egg. An egg white is clear, transparent, liquid. When you cook an egg, it turns opaque, turns white. And once you cook an egg, you can't get it back to the way it was. So very important in biological systems because you don't want this to happen in the extreme case in the human being, like either acidosis to extreme or temperature getting up too high. So we said enzymes were biological catalysts, and an enzyme is a protein. 
and enzymes regulate or and increase the speed of chemical reactions. And the reason why they're so effective is they lower the activation energy that's needed to make that reaction happen. And you can get millions of reactions per minute. This is a picture of enzyme action, and it's showing you two amino acids, and they bind to the active site in the enzyme, and that creates an enzyme substrate. These little peanuts here, the amino acids, are called the substrate. So that's the enzyme substrate complex. And they temporarily put these two um, amino acids in a position where the bond can form. See, if these are just flying around in space somewhere, they're not in a position to be close enough to each other to release that molecule of water. So the enzyme makes that happen by putting them in a position where this can occur. And then the water molecule comes out, forms a dipeptide, here's your peptide bond, and then the product is released after the bond's formed, and this goes back and picks up another couple amino acids and does it all over. So enzymes are not consumed by the reaction, they're not changed, they just keep, they're used over and over and over and over again to catalyze a reaction. So it's just like people that um, consume lactose, which is milk sugar. Uh, most people have the enzyme that can, you know, take that lactose and break it down into the individual building blocks, galactose and glucose. But there are some people that are lactose intolerant because they don't have this enzyme. So the lactose can build up in the body. It's not able to be degraded, and it causes a lot of bloating and pain and discomfort. So that's an example of, of an enzyme um, not being present and some of the problems that can be caused um, within that person not having that enzyme. And that's lactose intolerant, intolerance not having the enzyme lactase. Okay, our last group. I'm sure you've had enough of me by now. Nucleic acids are the largest, most complex molecules that you'll find in the body. So under organic compounds, this is our fourth group. We went through carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and now we have nucleic acids. So there's two types. There's deoxyribonucleic acid, also referred to as DNA, and ribonucleic acid, which is called RNA. Again, largest molecules in the body. The elements are C, O, H, N, and P. And these are polymers, meaning they're big complex structures. And they're made up of individual pieces that are called nucleotides. And a nucleotide is made up of a nitrogen base, a pentose sugar, and a phosphate group. That's what makes up a nucleotide. So here you can see a nucleotide here. Okay, there's your sugar, and there's your base, this is thymine, and there's your phosphate, that PO4 is phosphate, and there's your five carbon sugar there, okay? So this is called thymine. Over here you have another nucleotide, phosphate group, your carbon, your sugar, okay? Deoxyribose is the sugar, and then the base here is adenine. So you see the bases are different. This one looks a lot different shape than that one is. So these are different nucleotides. And you'll find that in DNA, see how it looks like a twisted ladder? The, um, the backbones of the ladder are made by um, adjacent sugar and phosphate groups. Okay, so these two things here go together and make up the backbones of the ladder. Then the bases are in the middle. And you see there's four bases. There's adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Now, there's a way that these bases pair up on these strands that they fit together. And A always goes with T, and C always goes with G, okay? And you can see there's hydrogen bonds holding those um, bases together. So you got an A here that goes with the T, and a C on this one goes with the G, A, T, and now you got a T and an A, and a C and a G, G, C. But see, they're, they're paired. They're not, um, they're not exactly the same. The strands are complementary. They're complements to each other. So differences between DNA and RNA, okay? DNA is a double strand. We just saw it. Okay, it looks like a ladder. RNA, generally a single strand. Um, the bases are different. Deoxyribose is what you have as a sugar in DNA. RNA has ribose as a sugar. 
And the bases used in the language between the two nucleotides is a little bit different too. Two nucleic acids is a little bit different. The bases use thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine. We already saw that. But in the language using RNA, there is no thymine in RNA. It's uracil. So it's a little bit different. So wherever you would want to put a T in that chain, you would put a U instead. Okay. So those are the three main differences between the two types of nucleic acids. And then the last structure we're going to talk about, the last molecule, is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This molecule is critical because it stores energy in phosphate groups, between phosphate groups. See those little squiggly lines? Those represent high energy phosphate bonds that can be broken. And when they're broken, they can release a lot of energy. So this molecule is what the cell is going to use when we get to the next chapter, when we talk about cells. That ATP is the energy, is the gasoline that the cell uses to drive its metabolic processes. So the whole molecule is called ATP. If you take one of these phosphates off and you have two left, you call that molecule adenosine diphosphate, ADP, a little bit lower energy. And if you're missing two phosphates and you have one left, that's called adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. And then, if you're just looking at the sugar and the base, that's called adenosine with no phosphate. So just different terminology, but that's the gasoline that drives cellular processes. And we have finished chapter two.